This is Andy Orham of O'Reilly Media. I'm talking with Peter Hinchens, who is one of the maintainers of the Zero MQ project, and he has just finished the book Zero MQ, The Definitive Guide, which is now an O'Reilly book, but actually it's been going on for years, I think, before O'Reilly got involved. Is that right? Good morning, Andy. Yeah, this has been a long project. Um, I started documenting Zero MQ for, for normal users because it was quite difficult to understand before that about, I think, three or four years ago. And uh, this became a, quite a, a large project involving the whole community, contributing examples mm -hmm. in all different languages. And I think it was, was it last year? We decided to turn it into an O'Reilly book, which is, which is an amazing thing. It's a, a great oh, book. Thank you. Thanks to O'Reilly. Fantastic. Yes, I recognize it as a community project like Zero MQ itself. Of course, but it, uh, the, the book has your style all over it. It's a very strong um, writing style that you've given to it. Yeah, it's my writing, but the examples, we have, think, we have examples in something like 30 or 40 languages. Not all of them, but a lot of them, which is really nice. You can look at a piece of ZeroMQ code in, in C and see how it works in Java, see how it works in Ruby, see how it works in Clojure, in any number of languages. And this is really fun. Now let's step back for a moment and talk about Zero MQ itself, what it is. A right. um, distinguished U.S. senator once said that the Internet is just a set of tubes. And I see, Zero gore, MQ, right? yeah. <laughs> I see Zero MQ as a sort of way of organizing these tubes, making them work together, managing them, and so forth. How would you characterize it? I think it's more about the pieces, the pieces which are joined together than the tubes. And what we have over time is this story of ever increasing, ever increasing numbers of pieces. And as, as programmers trying to make applications, we're just confronted by this problem. How do you connect not just two pieces or 20, but several hundred or several thousand over time? And what ZeroMQ has done successfully is to show ways, to show patterns of connecting these pieces very cheaply. And that's the key. It's, it's not the software itself. It's what it's demonstrated in terms of the science of scaling software over lots and lots of pieces. And this is what we try to do in the book as well, is to describe more and more of these patterns which you can use to, to build very large systems and which hopefully last a long time. And I suppose it makes it easy to move a piece of software from one host to another and keep everything connected. So this is one of the challenges of reducing the cost is being able to make very dynamic systems where software moves around, functionality moves around, you can start you know, dozens or hundreds of workers that can then you know, take tasks and, and work on them without having to design the whole network up front. And obviously this, this is kind of unusual maybe 10 years ago. Today, when you look at cloud and mobile, this is the way things work. We don't know in advance where we're going to be running software. It just tends to run on whatever's available. Um, and ZeroMQ does have a, a number of good solutions. It's not perfect, but it does have a number of good solutions for, for doing this. So you have um, publish and subscribe, but you also have some more sophisticated right. things in the book. So PubSub is a, is a great pattern. It comes, comes from, I guess, mainly financial data distribution where you have lots and lots of people interested in the same data. And, and how do you get millions of stock quotes a second to millions of subscribers? That's the challenge as one of the patterns. There's a three or four major patterns like that, um, distributing work, distributing information. Let's talk a bit about performance, too. You told me that uh, Zero MQ can work faster than plain old sockets over TCP, and that seems yeah. impossible. <laughs> so how do you justify it's a, that? It's a, it's a funny one. Actually, it's, TCP is a low-level, uh, obviously low-level library of a protocol set of sockets. On top of that, you write applications, and Zero MQ is one application, and people write their own applications. So when you write an application, uh, using TCP, you have to do a bunch of optimizations and uh, make it more efficient if you want performance. And they get harder and harder to do things like sending messages in the background while your application is running so you don't block, or combining messages into groups so you can send them in one go. People do spend a lot of time optimizing their applications. It can take months, years. Well, with Zero MQ, you get all of these optimizations in the library, so you just basically send stuff and it, it's all done in the background. So it's not really faster than TCP, but it is faster than uh, most TCP applications, but just like, twice as fast. Just like using a good compiler can be faster than writing your own assembly language. Exactly the same, that's right.
you could in theory write that optimized code, but it would it would it would break you every time. It'd be too expensive. How do you handle various types of reliability in zero MQ? Now this question comes up a lot. Um, my answer is reliability by itself is not very it doesn't mean very much. You have to define the problems that you're trying to solve. So if it's crashing applications, you know, people write code and the code has bugs and the bugs cause the code to crash. Or networks which are overloaded, you're trying to pump too much data through a network and things just give up and data gets lost. Or servers that run out of memory. You have to define the problems and each problem has has a good solution. And by collecting the different problems and their solutions, you can build reliability um, to suit your use case. And it really does depend on what you're trying to do. So with ZeroMQ, we don't have an out-of-the-box reliability solution. What we do is have a whole bunch of patterns and techniques that let you build very reliable networks. I think the key thing to reliability is just simplicity. Just make things simpler, then they won't break as easily. But you uh, do seem to develop uh, often many components. You might have a broker and you might have other sort of intermediaries between the clients and the servers. Right. Yes. Networking, networking does get complex. That's one of the just one of the things is that when you start having lots of pieces and they talk to each other in lots of ways, you get com combinations. It just explodes. And really the key to success when you have this explosion is to apply simple, simple patterns where you can remove pieces, remove complexity. It's very hard to do. It sounds easy, but it's very hard to do. And I think we have been successful in packaging up that experience of, you know, this has been decades that we've done this kind of work and how to make these scalable, simple systems. Sounds easy. It's not, though. I think that uh, with zero MQ and the kind of patterns you describe in the book, uh, you can at least sort of anticipate where problems will be and you know how to recover from each kind of problem. Right. That's right. And often it's as simple as just you can't deliver stuff, you throw it away. And end-to-end -end reliability is actually what the Internet is, is built on. It's, it seems to work very well. Trying to make reliability in the middle is usually uh, dangerous, I would say. So... One of the very interesting things you did, it's unusual for this book, was to spend a lot of time talking about the uh, philosophy behind the open source development style of Zero MQ. And I wonder what programmers can gain from this. What, is, what makes you a better programmer to understand how the community works? I think I just managed to slip that by you, Andy, and get that okay. in the book. But yes. I think this is an important subject, is to, um, to give other developers the benefit of our experience in, in making open source. Now, it doesn't just come from open source, of course, it comes from lots and lots of projects, is how to organize as groups and how to make better software uh, more, more cheaply. I think the lessons that we've learned in all of our projects in IMATICS, and it's been, it's been something like 15 years of been making open source of different kinds, but how to, how to organize around problems, I think these lessons benefit all developers. Um, I think this is also an emerging um, wisdom in the software industry is that building good software means working with other people and it means solving their problems rather than just making stuff. So we try to capture that. And it, it is important as a ZeroMQ user because you're betting on a certain technology. You do want to know how that's built and who's deciding what the next version looks like and how you can benefit from contributing to it in some cases. Um, all of our contributors are users. They're all people who have found it useful to get involved and take the product in certain directions. That's you know, one of its keys to success. And we do this with quite careful agreements and rules and little protocols about how you contribute, which I, I think a good model would be something like Wikipedia, which has also very clear rules on how you contribute and how you build up this base of knowledge. Well, getting ideas from the grassroots is, is a big part of uh, what you describe in the book, the work with the community, but also the sense of being practical, of scratching an itch and not trying to uh, develop a grand architecture in the background. You know, as an engineer, I love making grand architectures, and I used to spend years of my life doing that, building very large products with big ambition and then trying to sell them or trying to get people to use them. It's surprisingly difficult. Um, and it's shocking how often you're just completely wrong. 
the stuff you make is, is maybe very good technically, but it doesn't solve the really valuable problems. So one of the things we kind of discovered a year or two years ago was how to iterate our way through, through problems and get solutions out without really making a grand architecture. Um, again, it sounds simple, but it's really not that simple. Um, basically, you try to collect problems from users um, all the time, continuously, and let everybody contribute their ideas of solutions to those problems. And they may not be entirely right, often they're not, but they're already identifying the real problems for them. Let me give you an example. We have the ZeroMQ library, and it works in C++ or C, and it has a bunch of language bindings. Now, which language bindings are the most important? Um, it might be Java, it might be Ruby. Well, we don't know. And by saying to the community, look, you guys contribute what you can, and you tell us what's most important with your patches rather than just telling us, then we get a really good answer. And it turns out that it's, it's Python, it's Java, and it's probably C Sharp and .NET um, and C. And not making them ourselves, but getting people to, to tell us by, by code gives us very accurate answers over time. And we've applied this really to the, now the whole development process. If there's a problem that you'd like to be solved, then you send us a patch or you send us money. But just telling us the problem doesn't result in any changes. Do you suppose there are uh, some big production projects using uh, the Python interface? The funny thing about open source is that we don't really know who uses it. I mean, mm -hmm. we have indirect information through the number of downloads and the mailing list when people have problems. There are some very, very large customers using ZeroMQ. Very, Spotify did a, a talk a couple of days ago on it, and it was packed. Um, their back ends are on that now. Um, it's getting ubiquitous. I think ZeroMQ, through its different language bindings, is getting ubiquitous. I think in a couple of years, it'll be boring. It'll just be the way you do it. When you want to connect applications, you use ZeroMQ or something very similar to it. That's, that's the future. So since we talked about the community development process, let's look at uh, what's coming next for ZeroMQ. I know some open source people don't even like the word roadmap at all, but you don't seem to mind using it. So what's on the ZeroMQ roadmap? So we used to have roadmaps and we kicked them all out because they just they got in the way of having fun and making good stuff. It was kind of ironic. Users like roadmaps when they're telling their boss, this is what we're going to make. And the boss says, yeah, but what's it going to be like in two years' time? And they give this, this plan. And look, it looks convincing. But what people really want is, is um, stability. They want a certain guarantee of continuity. Um, people want their applications to keep running. They want their protocols to be interoperable. And they don't want things to break with new versions. And then on top of that, gradual improvements. So right now, what I'm working on is security, making a nice encryption uh, authentication layer inside zero mq which will make it finally ready for you know real wide-scale internet use what you send will be encrypted and will be authenticated and there's some very nice new security protocols very very elegant which fit into zero mq almost perfectly so the dod can start to use zero mq if they haven't already <laughs> i don't think the nsa is using zero mq yet no they mm -hmm. they have certain they have a, a rather higher uh, barrier for, for what they call a hard system yeah. Well, thank you very much for talking with me, Peter. Well, thank you, Andy. It's always fun to, to talk.